Hi, folks. My name is Tim Hendricks. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Styra and one of the co-creators of the Open Policy Agent Project. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about some design patterns that we've seen uh, through the use of Open Policy Agent uh, that help you solve a variety of cloud native authorization problems. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is I'd start out with a little bit of an introduction to what do I mean by authorization and cloud native and, and OPA. So I'll give you a quick primer there. And then what we'll do is go ahead and dig into what uh, what these design patterns are, these you know common solutions to common problems. Okay, so authorization, remember, uh, is, is this problem that we like to talk about where you're trying to control that the, the actions that either people or machines are making. Uh, you know, I always like to give an example of, you know, imagine you're logging into your banking application. Um, every time you do, maybe you want to look at your the, the uh, account balances for all of your accounts, and maybe you want to withdraw or deposit money. So every time you're reading information, every time you're trying to take an action, like withdrawing money, there's an authorization problem that that application has to enforce. Uh, similarly, if you're a developer and you're actually responsible for building and running that application, there are all kinds of authorization decisions that are also being made uh, to make sure that you're not doing anything by, by mistake. So every time you're spinning up a new uh, resource on a Kubernetes cluster, or every time you're uh, reconfiguring your application, those are actions you're taking and authorization controls are in place to make sure that you're not doing something that you shouldn't be. Uh, don't confuse authorization here with authentication. Remember, authentication is a problem of uh, sign-in, of identity, of proving to the machine you are who you say you are. We're not going to be talking about authentication at all or identity at all. We'll just assume that's a solved problem. And today we're going to be focused on authorization. So how do you how do you build software that uh, gives the administrator controls over uh, what that software's uh, users, uh, what actions those users can take? Now, the key observation here is that authorization happens everywhere in cloud native. Every time you're trying to spin up a new resource in a CI CD pipeline, there's an authorization problem that needs to be solved. Every time your uh, and, uh, microservice receives an API call, is that API call authorized or not? Every time somebody's running a query on a database, is that authorized or not? Anytime somebody's trying to spin up a resource on a Kubernetes cluster, is that authorized or not? Same way with Terraform, same way with your servers. So over and over, what we see is that every piece of software on the planet actually has to solve this authorization problem. And so uh, uh, at Styra, when we created the open policy agent, we designed it to, to provide a unified way of solving this, this authorization, more generally the policy problem, throughout this cloud native ecosystem. So the idea behind OPA is that it provides you a single policy language for expressing uh, all of those rules and regulations about which people or machines can perform which actions on which software. It, it also includes an engine that when you load it with one of those policy files, knows how to make decisions. And then there's a bunch of tooling that, we've, the, the, that we in the community have helped build up around OPA. Uh, and then there are a whole bunch of different integrations that OPA uh, and the community has, has built for OPA with a bunch of software systems. A lot of those you see on, on, on the screen. Now, uh, what you can see here is a list of kind of the, the different uh, uh, areas where OPA has been applied by someone uh, in production at scale, right? So this isn't you know, just a, a screen where we're hoping someday to apply OPA, but, but rather in all these cases, somebody has applied OPA in production at scale. Uh, to each of these categories, not necessarily to each of the logos. Um, so that's kind of OPA, and that's what it was designed to do, is to provide that, that unified solution to policy. Now, uh, like I mentioned, uh, when we started this at Styra, we eventually donated it to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation a couple of years later. It, it's, went, it's gone through the full uh, sort of maturity cycle from sandbox to incubating to graduated. So graduated within the CNCF is the same level that Kubernetes, Prometheus, Envoy, the, some of the most popular cloud native projects on the planet um, are, 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 are at that level as well. Uh, it's got a growing community. There's certainly a, a great uh, Slack channel. If you have questions about it, just feel free to hop on there. Uh, lots of folks are there to help you out. Uh, it is within the CNCF ecosystem, really the only project that's, that's focused on uh, policy in general. Uh, it is also the only graduated policy project. Um, in terms of active end users, that's actually one way I like to, to like uh, it, it engage with a new open source project is to sort of listen to the end users about uh, how they're using it, uh, what they're doing, where its rough edges are, so on and so forth. So there are a couple of great uh, venues that I'll point you to where there just happened to be a uh, like a good collection of end users talking about 
how they're using OPA. So it, it happened to be like, you know, b- before pandemic, uh, sort of the last physical KubeCon back in 2019, you know, there are a bunch of folks talking about different use cases about how you can apply OPA. So Yelp was talking about microservice authorization. Uh, Goldman here is talking about Kubernetes authorization. I think SNCC was doing the same. Reddit was doing the same as Kubernetes. And then there was also an OPA summit uh, that we held at that same at that same conference where uh, you know you can talk, you can listen to Cap One uh, talk about Kube or or Chef talk about how they embedded it into OPA into their application. Pinterest using it for actually several different use cases. I, I believe Kafka was one that uh, at the data layer that they that they focused on as well. Atlassian uh, as well at the uh, at the at the application level. So. Uh, go ahead and check those out, uh, and we'll touch on some of those and go into some of those different use cases in a bit more detail later, uh, but it's definitely a good way to get to know OPA. So what is OPA? I kind of gave you a quick overview, but uh, what is it in, in a little bit more detail? This is the picture we always like to show the first time we're introducing OPA. The idea behind it is pretty simple, really. It, the idea is that any service, and that service could be a microservice or it could be a service mesh or a, or a Terraform, uh, a Terraform uh, process or the Kubernetes API server or Kafka, or really any, anything, that service decides at some point in time that it needs an authorization decision. And so what it does is it sends a policy query over to OPA and says, hey, give me a decision. OPA returns that decision. Now it's the service's responsibility to enforce the decision. It is OPA's responsibility to make the decision. So really OPA is, sometimes people like to call it a decision point. Uh, that's really the, the, how we think about the, the responsibilities for both the service and OPA. Now, there are a couple of things on the slide I'll call your attention to, one of which is that policy query could really be any arbitrary JSON value. Let me give you a couple of examples. If the service is a microservice, maybe it sends across to OPA uh, a JSON object that has three keys, a method, a user, and a path. If that service, on the other hand, is like the Kubernetes API server, then maybe what it hands over as a policy query to OPA is you know, several hundred lines of JSON that represent that new pod or that new ingress or whatever the developer was trying to, to deploy onto the Kubernetes server. OPA doesn't really understand what the real world semantics of that policy query are in any way, shape, or form. OPA just sees that policy query as JSON. The way this works then is that I, when I, as a person, am writing a policy and loading that policy to OPA, I know where OPA has been deployed. I, as a person, know what a Kubernetes ingress is and, and what kinds of rules and regulations I want to put in place for that Kubernetes uh, resource. I, as a person, know which API calls for my microservice I want to allow or deny. And so I, as a person, can go ahead and write the appropriate policy um, that is appropriate to make decisions for that query. All right, the, what that means then is that the policy language itself needs to be flexible enough that I can go ahead and write whatever policy I like over really any arbitrary JSON data that comes in as a query. And so Rega was designed for exactly this purpose. It is purpose-built to be a policy language. It was purpose-built to be able to do things like deal with deeply nested JSON data, to be able to iterate over the contents of, of the arrays or even the key value pairs uh, that you'll see commonly in that JSON. Um, and it was designed with, I think it's over 150 different pre-built uh, um, functions that can do things like string manipulation, Cedar, you know, network Cedar IP address arithmetic, um, uh, JOT uh, manipulation and the like. The next thing up on the slide is really that data and JSON. So we've already talked about how OPA and Rego were sort of designed uh, so that you can write arbitrary over arbitrary JSON values. Well, one of the things that we sometimes see people needing to do is write policy over uh, uh, information that's not natively contained within that policy query. These policies, we like to call them uh, 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 context aware. So we like to say that these policies make decisions uh, based on the information about what's going on in the world. Well, how does OPEN know about what's going on in the world? How, how does that work? Well, that's what this data and JSON uh, part of the picture shows. Is it shows that you can inject that arbitrary data into OPA as long as it's arbitrary JSON. Good example here is let's suppose you want to write a policy that says only people who are on call can make changes to my production Kubernetes cluster, can um, uh, run uh, API calls against my production applications, and can whatever run queries on a production database. Well, who do you, who's on call? How do you know? Well, OPA doesn't know. Your Kubernetes service doesn't know. Your application doesn't know. Your database doesn't know. Even your IDP, your identity provider, whether it's AD or, or something else, it, it doesn't know either. 
on call information is typically stored in something, some third party service like PagerDuty. So what you can do is set up a, a little script that will go ahead and pull the data out of PagerDuty and inject it into OPA. And now suddenly OPA just knows who's on call. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the idea behind that, that data in JSON on the lower right-hand side. Last point on the slide is that policy decision. That policy decision, as is noted there, can be arbitrary JSON again. I hope you notice the theme. The idea here is that while it is certainly the case that, the, that perhaps the primary use case for OPA is authorization, and typically people think of authorization as making allow, deny, ones and zeros, true, false decisions, what you end up doing with OPA a lot of the time is returning policy decisions that are far more complicated JSON objects. I'll give you a couple of examples. Suppose you wanted to write a policy that made a rate limiting decision. Maybe the policy decision in that case is a number. Maybe instead you want to write a, a policy that uh, makes a decision about where you're authorized to deploy an application. Maybe there the answer is actually an array of the names of clusters. Or, uh, and this happens just all the time, maybe when you make an authorization decision about whatever, an HTTP API, you want to return not just the Boolean yes, no, but also maybe, is there an error message? Is there a status code? And in that case, you might want to return multiple values as a JSON object. So in any case, uh, the, the idea behind this is that the policy decision itself can be arbitrary JSON. All right, so that's OPA in a nutshell. Hopefully I've given you a good sense as to what OPA uh, can do. What I haven't really talked about are best practices around how you deploy it, but that's the point of the, of the rest of the talk. One of the ideas here, and one of the reasons that OPA is so powerful is that when you get to, to the deployment piece, like how do you actually run OPA, um, you have a number of different, very, uh, you have a very, uh, uh, there are several different ways to do that. One of which is you can run as a CLI, you can embed it as a library, or whether as a Go library, or if you're interested in WASM, uh, WebAssembly, um, you can go ahead and compile policies down to that. You can run OPA as a sidecar or a daemon as well. You can even use OPA as a building block to create a centralized authorization service. So architecturally speaking, uh, OPA is quite flexible and you can deploy it to achieve whatever goals you want. Another degree of flexibility that, again, people gravitate to OPA for is the policy language itself. It is a purpose-built policy language. It is more expressive than, meaning that you can encode all the normal kinds of, of, of policy frameworks that you're used to, whether it's role-based access control or attribute-based or access control lists or even IAM policies that you might see in a public cloud, like you could do all of those with OPA. OPA is, however, a purpose-built policy language, meaning it's not as expressive as a programming language. And so you, what OPA tries to do is balance the need for expressiveness, uh, but also give you the benefits of, of a language that has a bunch of safeguards built into it. So you don't have to worry about things like infinite loops. Another, another reason that people pick up OPA is its flexibility around how you compose policies. So OPA borrows a lot uh, from uh, traditional programming languages in the sense that you, you don't just load OPA with one policy, you can load OPA with a whole collection of policies that are all namespaced, just like you would in a normal programming language. And then you can have one policy invoke another, another policy. Um, and the way that that, and what, one of the things that that materializes in is that you can write common libraries and then have two different teams write their own policies that both reference and utilize that common library. So there's a bunch of different uh, dimensions in which OPA is flexible. Uh, there's probably another couple that I don't have on here around you know, injecting data into OPA. Uh, you've got quite a bit of flex flexibility there as well. All this flexibility is wonderful because it allows you to solve a, a, a broad range of policy and authorization problems. That was the purpose for which we designed OPA to begin with, of course. But what it also means is that you need to understand how to apply OPA to solve your problems and navigate through uh, all of that flexibility to pick uh, the, the, and make the decisions that you need to, 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 to meet your requirements. Whenever we're talking to folks about how to do this, uh, we typically boil down the discussion to three key questions. The first of which is, what policies do, are you trying to enforce? You know, are you talking about enforcing policies about whatever, Kubernetes or APIs, people, machines? Do you care about really complex resources? Uh, or do you care at all about the actions, whether it's create uh, or, or delete? So that's one, one, of the, one of the key dimensions. The next is what software are you trying to enforce this in? 
you know, if you're thinking about an application, are you are you are you able to enforce policy at the gateway level, at the backend level, at the database level, at the uh, maybe it's even lower in the infrastructure cases where you're you're thinking about enforcing at the Kubernetes layer in your CI pipeline. Um, and then that'll have implications around architecturally, how do you actually deploy it? You know, do you even have the opportunity to run it as a sidecar? The third uh, idea here is really the data. So it's crucial to understand the data dependencies for the policies that you want to, to enforce. Some policies, for example, require lots of data. If you, were to, if you were to write a policy that says only the owner of a resource can delete it, it's fine to write that policy, but what you then need anytime you're making a decision, which is, you know, can Alice delete uh, resource foo 123, is you need some external data about, well, is Alice the owner of that resource foo 123 or not? So that data, the data dependencies matters uh, quite, a, quite a bit when you're trying to think about policy. And then these, these three things are all related to each other, right? So like if you're trying to enforce a policy at a, at a gateway, uh, then you have to realize that you may not be able to, to shuttle all the data you need to to enforce the policies you want at the gateway. Whereas if you were to move this further down in the, uh, in the architecture and enforce it at the back end, well, maybe you've already got that data available about who is the owner of which resource. And so therefore the data dependencies are, are much easier to satisfy. So these are the kind of the three uh, dimensions um, that we typically talk with folks about in order to understand how to properly apply OPA. The purpose of this talk is to really go through three and, and maybe three and a half design patterns that we have seen people successfully use and deploy to solve authorization problems. What is the design pattern for OPA? Well, it's very analogous to the design pattern for software engineering. Remember in software engineering, we're really talking about this idea that you have a common programming problem. And then what you wanna do is uh, a design pattern sort of gives you an algorithmic solution, a way of solving that programming problem. With OPA, a design pattern is very analogous. The, the idea is that we're going to describe a common policy problem, and then the design pattern describes an architectural solution that helps you solve it. It gives you a starting point uh, for solving your authorization problems. Now, there are just like any design pattern in software engineering, there are, uh, I think we'll, we'll see seven different sort of properties or fields that, that we'll discuss. Uh, we won't go into all of them in, in, in a great deal of detail, but, um, but not surprisingly, three of those are the ones we just described, like the software architecture that you're deploying, the policy, and any sort of data requirements on that uh, that are required to evaluate that policy. So those are the three things, those are sort of the key three decisions that you're gonna make. And then for each design pattern, we're gonna, we're gonna go and talk about some other sort of consequences of those decisions. Um, in, in fact, you know, we'll talk about what are the performance characteristics um, of, that, of those decisions, what are the security, uh, characteristics of those decisions. And, and obviously there are some more decisions that you need to make for, for each of those. Um, but then also what, what, what are the key problems that this, uh, what are the key user stories or, or problems there uh, that this particular solution, th this particular design pattern solves? Um, and then, you know, why would you use this to begin with? Uh, so anyway, you will go through uh, these, these three to four different design patterns. And for each one, we'll quickly touch on, on all of these to give you a sense as to uh, what, um, how to get started with OPA. All right, like I said, we're gonna have three to four. That's why I keep saying four is one of these is emerging. Uh, but there, when, when I think about the design patterns, I really break them into these two dimensions. So one of the dimensions is really what domain are we talking about? And there are two domains that we'll cover today. One of which is configuration slash infrastructure. So the real idea here is that you're talking about Kubernetes or Terraform or something where um, uh, some typically developers trying to create uh, some new resource, and that resource is pretty complicated. So, you know, you're talking about several hundred lines of JSON data, um, and you're trying to put guardrails in place to make sure that those, uh, that those resources, um, that those configurations are, are done correctly and that, and that don't have any security or compliance or operational problems. So that's one domain, configuration authorization. Another domain that we'll talk about is APIs or, or maybe applications. The idea here is that the things that you're handing over to OPA uh, to make decisions are relatively small. They're not several hundred lines of JSON. They're, you know, three, four, five, ten lines, maybe. So a good example, there would be an HTTP API. Maybe you give uh, a, uh, OPA a user, a method, and a path. And that's really all you need from an input point of view. And then you're just trying to make a, a decision whether that user is authorized to perform that action on that resource. 
So that's, that's one dimension is domain. The other dimension here that we'll talk about is sort of compute power. How much compute power are you willing or need to provide um, to, to address your, your authorization challenges? And it's either small or large. Um, and so we'll see what I mean by that. In, in some sense, this, this corresponds to uh, online versus offline and centralized versus, uh, versus distributed. Okay, so let's jump into our first design pattern. Uh, the first one here is really offline uh, configuration authorization. Imagine that you have a CI CD pipeline. You've got developers who are continually checking configuration files into your, let's say, your Git repo. Um, and what you want to do is put some authorization policies, some rules, regulations in place to, 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 to just check that those configuration files are safe to be checked into Git or, or then perhaps if you're employing GitOps, even deployed to real live systems. Um, this is a common thing that we see people do all the time. Now, how do you address this problem with, with OPA? Well, how do you apply OPA? Well, there actually, you can apply OPA in a couple of different locations and, and ways to address this problem. In fact, sometimes you might want to apply them all. And so that's what you see here. What you see is that one way you can apply OPA is to, to apply it sort of on a developer laptop and have OPA run on a developer's laptop. Uh, to evaluate all those rules against source code or configuration file changes that that developer is making long before they get uploaded to the CI pipeline. And then later, you could actually use OPA uh, as part of like a unit testing framework effectively to go ahead and run OPA against those configuration files as part of a CI check uh, and then fail the PR if those checks, if those checks uh, uh, don't pass. You could even think about doing this later, which is like after the, the files get committed, maybe you've changed your policies. You've increased the rule, the set of rules that you're trying to apply. And now what you want to do is actually scan that repository and all the files in it to tell you whether there are any, any files that already uh, or, or that, that have already been committed uh, that, that fail your new policy checks. So it's another fine application of OPA. And in all these cases, this is kind of the architectural view of things. Where, how do you apply OPA? Uh, to, and where, where do you apply OPA to enforce these policies that you might want to write? And the nice thing about this is all three of these instances of OPA, as shown in this picture, well, they could be one instance in reality of OPA, but, but the three different applications of OPA, they can all use exactly the same policy. Uh, what kinds of policies do people end up writing? Well, here's a, here's a couple of very different examples. One is drawn from Kubernetes. The other is just a random uh, configuration file for your application. And here what we see is maybe you want to write a policy here about you know, the labels that you require on load balancers. Maybe you want to say every single one of these um, uh, load balancers in Kubernetes has to have an owner label, right? That's a sensible thing to say. On the, on the application configuration, you can imagine a similar kind of policy. I think for this one, what we said was, oh, just ensure that this storage, uh, that, that let's say we're deploying this for production, that uh, this, you know, this URL has to end in huli.com. All right, I, I won't go through the details here. If you haven't seen OPA's policy language, uh, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, for those of you who've seen it before, what you'll notice is that we're writing some deny statements, which means that these policies for configuration are often block lists, right? You're enumerating the conditions under which you want to uh, reject a, a, a file. And then what you're also doing is you're providing human readable error messages. So at the end of the day, you can kind of make it out here. It's saying, hey, uh, if this if this check pass uh, sorry if this check succeeds and what we're saying is hey we found a load balancer that doesn't have an owner label and so that's what exactly we'll actually tell the user about so that when they get this failure on the CI check or on their laptop uh, they actually see what what thing they need to go and fix. What are the sort of uh, oh, oh uh, the third remember we've talked about two of the three different uh, properties of of, of um, the prescriptive properties of this design pattern, the policy and the architecture. In terms of data, typically what we see in this case is not a lot of external data being used. Remember, um, you know, we talked about the pager duty example, for example. Um, we don't see a lot of external data. Two, two um, exceptions to that rule, one of which is that sometimes people end up wanting to write policies that span multiple files. If you're doing that, then you have to have some sort of additional data. You need to be scanning uh, like the set of all files together, as opposed to simply scanning them one at a time. So arguably that falls into the external data category. Uh, 
The other thing that sometimes we see people do is want to, to have a mechanism whereby they'll uh, allow for an exclusion framework or an exception framework that says, hey, apply this rule generally to all of my files, except maybe, you know, there's this one team, they've got this file, they can't change it, there are good reasons they can't change it. And so you just need to be able to turn off that, that violation. Um, you need to be, basically be able to turn off that rule for that particular file. And so that would be the exception. And often that's done through, through external data for OPA. Performance characteristics that you get out of this, a latency is super relaxed, right? If it takes a second, that's fine. If it's a minute, that's probably fine too. You're often running this in a CI pipeline. Not so great in a developer laptop. Obviously, you'd like that to be quicker. Um, availability here, uh, you'll see later why, why we, we, we talk about both throughput and availability. These aren't really an issue in, in, in this particular use case because everything is offline. Security, again, not a, not a real challenge. Uh, you know, dev laptops are fine. What you're really more concerned about is usability there anyway. That's the only real reason to run the checks in a, on a dev laptop. PR checks, routine scans, you know, those are, those are pretty secure. Uh, concrete problems, I usually think of these as user stories. So, you know, from a DevOps point of view, um, I, I, maybe you want to put guardrails on your CI pipeline. Uh, that's a great use case here. From a security point of view, maybe you actually want to automate a bunch of the security checks that you would have to do manually. Uh, that's, that's another great uh, kind of concrete problem. And then from a developer point of view, maybe you've got a whole bunch of new folks who you're trying to onboard. And what you want to do is instead of just teaching them how to configure Kubernetes or, or your applications correctly, you just want to take that wiki and turn it into code so that they can, uh, so that you don't have to actually teach them uh, quite as much. They can learn through interacting with software. Okay, so that's the first design pattern. Hopefully that one was, was fairly clear. We'll go through this next one a little bit quicker because this next design pattern is really the online version of configuration authorization. The setup is very similar. It's the same kind of problem, except what we're doing in this case is we're actually trying to enforce rules within the API server that's supposed to be protecting and running, let's say, Kubernetes or your public cloud or whatever those, those, wherever those configuration files are going. So here you're really trying to inject uh, OPA and enforcement into and protect your real live platform instead of some offline kind of thing. Um, so uh, here's the kind of architectural picture you've got in this case to be able to hook OPA into that API server that protects Kube or, or your, your, your public cloud. So you've got to be able to hook um, OPA into that API server. And then what you want is to ensure that every single request going into that API server is routed through OPA to make sure that OPA can actually make the authorization decisions. And then obviously if OPA says, nope, that resource isn't good, the API server needs to be able to return a reasonable response back to the caller and say, hey, no, nope, we rejected this and here's why. And obviously if OPA uh, allows the check, then the API needs to go ahead and, 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 and continue processing that request as if it never even asked OPA. Um, for Kubernetes, this is a very popular use case for OPA. Uh, I will just call out here that what you see with Kube is that you don't have, just have one API server, you have many, right? Every Kubernetes cluster has its own API server. And so you might not end up with just one instance of OPA. You could end up with many instances of OPA, uh, not just on one cluster, but across multiple clusters. So wherever those API calls are, uh, the idea for this online configuration authorization problem is that you're always, you always have an OPA hooked in and that OPA can run locally or centrally. It's really up to you. But but typically what we see is that OPA is run locally next to and on top of uh, effectively each of the API servers that you're integrated with. Um, one interesting thing that happens in this case at the policy level is that um, the API server often has this ability to take the inputs that the users provided and say, here is my Kubernetes resource or here's my you know, public cloud resource and transform them before it hands that description of the resource off to OPA. And so that's what you're seeing here. This happens with Kube all the time. So when you're submitting a resource to, to Kubernetes, you as a person, as a developer, will submit the file that you see here. Uh, and then uh, Kubernetes will send it through this pipeline of stuff. And by the time OPA sees it, it'll see this much different uh, collection uh, or much different uh, YAML file in this case. And all that's done is it's added some structure to it. It's filled in some defaults. And as you can see, it's quite a bit longer. So that's one difference when you go from offline to online is that you have to deal with policies that are written over an input handed to OPA that's not necessarily the same as the input that people are accustomed to. Again, though, policies conceptually are the same. They're, they're blockless. You're still generating human readable messages. 
Uh, and then and then here, I guess what I've said is just what I said already. You're operating on these intermediary representations that really the outside world might not know about otherwise. External data, uh, you know, there are, uh, there's a little bit more external data that we see on online configuration. Uh, sorry, that's a bug in the slide. In the online configuration authorization use case. Uh, why? Because maybe, you know, you're uploading a binary and so you want to do a, a scan against, or sorry, you want to apply a rule uh, that goes ahead and takes into account the result of a virus, of a, of a, sorry, of a security scan. <laughs> Um, or maybe you've got exceptions. Maybe you've got multi-resource policies. We see that, you know, often as well. Like, don't allow a new ingress to be created if there's another ingress that's using the same DNS. Performance here is quite a bit different. Latency numbers are between 10 and 100 milliseconds. Much, much different than than the offline case. Throughput, uh, yeah, you've got multiple requests happening all the time. You're on the critical path. OPA is at this point on the critical path for making authorization decisions. So throughput does matter. Uh, OPA does support multi-threading, and of course, uh, you could go ahead and run multiple instances of, instances of OPA as well. Availability here is crucial. Uh, once you're hooked into the API server, it is super important to make a decision about whether uh, you're going to fail open or fail closed uh, with all the consequences of, of, of each one. If you decide to go fail open, uh, then what you probably want is a compensating control that's doing that the equivalent of that sort of um, uh, platform scan that we talked about. Um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the offline case, where the idea here is that you're actually able to give out a report that says, here are all the resources that are, that are violating my policies. Security, super important to make sure this is secure. You, what you don't want is if you're, if you're actually responsible for the security of your platform, you need to make sure you're doing things like setting up auth in and auth C and encrypting traffic. Next up in the design pattern is design pattern number three. Here we're going to shift away from that configuration or that infrastructure authorization. We're going to focus more on the application, the API authorization. So here the idea is you've got an application. It's trying to, to service the, uh, its end user's needs. But that end user is maybe somebody like me. I'm logged into my bank uh, and I'm trying to withdraw money from my account. Is that authorized or is it not? There are all kinds of different ways that you can actually integrate Opal. One popular one is shown here. You integrate it into the service mesh or into a network proxy, uh, and, and then you just uh, um, go ahead and, and have OPA make the decisions that it normally would. Is this API call authorized or is it not? Architecturally, um, uh, here we've generalized this a little bit. The key here to the architecture is that we're going to run OPA as a sidecar. We see this happening over and over. The idea being that you have in this picture, notice that each of these big boxes is a server. So if you've got, and within that server, you've got the service, like an instance of your, of your microservice and an instance of OPA. And so that service is sending requests to and from OPA to get, to get decisions. Importantly, if you've got 500 instances of like a microservice application and you're running OPA as a sidecar, then you have 500 instances of OPA. So the idea here is that you're running OPA very close to the service to get high availability and high performance. Uh, here, in terms of policies, uh, again, you could write either network level policies that kind of look at, you know, source and destination. You could look at, uh, or, or, or you could up a level that a bit to even talk about the, the like the L7 uh, method user path. So you could certainly do that. Uh, or you could also apply this use case to, to make application or business level policy decisions. Here, you know, you just kind of see maybe I'm handing over a user with some groups and a resource and a... Uh, and an action, and then you're just making a decision. You know, does this, can this user execute this action on this resource? Can this user execute this HTTP method on this path? Typically here, we're optimizing for speed and the policies that you write are typically allow and deny. Uh, sometimes they'll return multiple items, but the, 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 core of that, um, the core of that policy is really focused on allow and deny, maybe with some status codes or maybe a little bit of an error message. Secondary properties here, external data. Uh, remember, this is OPA is running as a sidecar. So this external data needs to be very small and static. You can't be replicating 10 gigabytes of data to every instance of your microservice all the time. Uh, good examples there might be open API metadata, like you find in open API, relatively small and stable, public keys. Uh, in addition, the other big source of, of, of information that people use um, is really typically the information contained in a job. 
So in an application, you often have a user sign in and then authenticate, and then they're sending this jot around. Uh, and the, that, that jot can be handed to OPA to have OPA make good decisions by inspecting the internals of that token. Performance here, oh, uh, quite a bit different. Uh, again, we're hitting here one millisecond targets, not even 10, not even 100 that we saw in the last one, but here it's like one millisecond targets. Throughput, uh, you know, you're talking about trying to get 1,000 QPS. Uh, availability is absolutely crucial. This is actually the main reason that you would run OPA as a sidecar. You run OPA as a sidecar so that what you know is that you're no longer reliant on the network to get an authorization decision. You can just jump over local host. Security, typically what we'll see people do is rely on host level security. Like once somebody, uh, an attacker has compromised the host, there's so many things that they, that they can do uh, that we typically don't see people uh, uh, spend a whole lot of time worrying about securing the connection between OPA and the microservice because it's all in the same host. For somebody to actually compromise that means that they've gotten access to the host. Um, do though make sure that your uh, OPA APIs are restricted so that they can only be accessed through the local host. Uh, concrete problems here, zero trust is certainly one, you know, making sure that every API, whether it's a microservice API or it's your public facing APIs have good authorization in place. Uh, we've heard people talk about using this as a mechanism to get different teams within an organization, within like a microservice development environment to, to coordinate so that, you know, if team A wants to start using team B service, team A has got to come and tell team B, hey, I, I need, I, I'd like to use your service um, so that team A doesn't so, sort of suddenly in production uh, flood team B services and, and they not be able to handle the, the load. End user authorization is another one that we'll see people deploy this way. Last one, it's an emerging pattern. Uh, this one isn't, um, uh, uh, we're starting to see this more and more. So this one's a, a much quicker one. Here are the ideas that you've got an application and it is really in this mode where um, you've got, uh, it needs authorization decisions and you wanna decouple those authorization decisions from the application. But at the same time, what you don't wanna do um, because of data load is run OPA as a sidecar. So in this case, what you end up with is using OPA as a building block for a centralized service because of basically data gravity. You've got too much data there. And so we're seeing people deploy OPA uh, more often like this. Uh, the kinds of policies people write are, are sort of similar to the ones that we just saw. You know, business level policies, policies about whether employees can perform actions or their end customers can perform actions. Uh, always, almost always here, I see a, a, a large amount of external data. Uh, LDAP and AD would be an example. Uh, often permissions data is what we see. Uh, people storing or using OPA for performance here. You know, it's not. Uh, it can't be as uh, as uh, the latency can't be as extraordinary as for sidecar. Uh, you know, looking at ten millisecond targets uh, or on the order of ten millisecond targets. Throughput though has got to be very high, right? Because now you've got a centralized service. You can't rely on on sort of distributing the load to the edge. And availability is of course crucial. And what we see people do there is is replication. Security here, you've got to go ahead and secure all of the OPA APIs in the usual ways, auth in, auth Z, and, 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 um, and encryption in transit. Um, you know, a couple of concrete problems here around how do you migrate applications to the cloud if they're dependent on an on-prem LDAP, or just how do you build a centralized permission system for applications? Okay, the thing to take away, several different um, uh, design patterns that you can look at, that you can look at to give you a good starting point uh, for applying OPA to solve your authorization problems. And by all means, check us out online. Uh, there are a couple of different places here. I'm hoping, uh, sorry, I'm in the midst of putting all this material together as a blog. So hopefully you'll have another form uh, to look at this too. Hope that was helpful uh, and, and definitely check us out online. Thanks all.